Now we will talk about another important tropical disease called leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is a tropical disease which is caused by leishmania species. And in general, leishmaniasis is one of the vector-borne tropical diseases. And that means it's similar to malaria. It's transmitted through a specific vector. But the vector here which transmits leishmaniasis is a sand fly. And more specifically, leishmaniasis is transmitted by infected female flibotomine sand flies. And in general, there are three main forms of leishmaniasis. The first form of leishmaniasis is called visceral leishmaniasis. And this is the most aggressive form of leishmaniasis. Visceral leishmaniasis is caused mainly by a species of leishmania called leishmania donovani. And this form or this type of leishmaniasis is scattered in different areas in the world, but it's more endemic in the Indian subcontinent areas and in Africa. But it can be found in other areas in the world. Then the second form of leishmaniasis is called cutaneous leishmaniasis. And this form of the disease is also, it's also distributed in different regions in the world, and it's even more widely distributed than visceral leishmaniasis. And it can be considered as the most common form of leishmaniasis worldwide. So visceral leishmaniasis is the most aggressive type of leishmaniasis, while cutaneous type is the most common type worldwide. The possible species which result in cutaneous leishmaniasis is different according to the region where you will find the infection. In the old world, and by the old world we mean Europe, Asia, and Africa, cutaneous leishmaniasis is caused by three main species. Number one, we have leishmania major, leishmania tropica, and leishmania ethiopica. While in the new world, which means the Americas, in the new world, cutaneous leishmaniasis is caused by two main species, which are, which are leishmania mexicana and leishmania brasiliensis. Then finally, we have mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, and this form of leishmaniasis is the least common type of leishmaniasis. And it's mainly caused by leishmania brasiliensis. So leishmania brasiliensis is associated with cutaneous leishmaniasis in the new world. And also it's associated with mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. So during this lecture, we will try to differentiate between these three main types of leishmaniasis. But first, let's talk about the life cycle of the leishmania parasite. Because as we said previously, in order to understand the clinical features and how the complications develop in tropical diseases, you need to know the life cycle of the cause of these tropical diseases. So let's talk about the life cycle of leishmania parasite. As we said, leishmaniasis is a disease which is transmitted by vectors, and the vector is sand fly. So initially, the parasite will enter the body by after the bite of the sand fly. So when the sand fly bites the human, it will introduce stage or form of the parasite called promastigotes. So promastigotes, this is the initial form of the leishmania parasite which will enter the human body following the bite of the sand fly. Then immediately these promastigotes inside the human body immediately it will be taken up by the neutrophils. And then these neutrophils will undergo apoptosis and it will release these promastigotes. Then these promastigotes will be taken up and it will be engulfed by the macrophages, by phagocytosis. And inside the macrophages, promastigotes will start to proliferate and it will transform into another form called amastigotes. And eventually, the, the new form, which is called amastigotes, will multiply within the macrophages and it will induce lysis of the macrophages and it will be released from the macrophages. And then these amastigotes will result in the pathology of leishmaniasis. So the pathogenic form of leishmania species is called amastigotes. The initial form which enters the body from the bite of the sand fly is called promastigote. But the, the, the form of the parasite which will produce the disease is called amastigotes. And these amastigotes initially multiply within the macrophages. These are intracellular parasites which will multiply within the macrophages and eventually it will induce lysis of the macrophages and it will be released from the macrophages. And after that it will produce the disease. Then the type of the disease will depend on the species. And it will depend on the type of leishmaniasis which will develop after that. In case of cutaneous leishmaniasis, the amastigotes will proliferate and it will invade the dermal layer of the skin. So it will produce a cutaneous disease, which is called cutaneous leishmaniasis. And in case of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, the amastigotes 
will invade the dermal layer of the skin as well as the mucosa. It will invade also mucosal membranes, like the mucosal membranes lining the upper airways. And so the disease will be called mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. But in case of visceral leishmaniasis, when it's caused by leishmania donovani, these amastogoids will not just multiply in the skin, but it will also enter the bloodstream, and it will result in parasitemia. And following entry in the bloodstream, these parasites are intracellular parasites, and it has the tendency to multiply within the reticuloendothelial cells. So that means these mastigoids, when it enters the bloodstream, it will immediately go to the reticuloendothelial system. And as we said previously, the reticuloendothelial system is a network of cells, a network of mononuclear phagocytic cells, which are scattered in different areas in the body, but are mainly found in large numbers in the liver and in the spleen, in the bone marrow and in the lymph nodes. So that means these amastigoids in visceral leishmaniasis will multiply and proliferate within the reticuloendothelial organs, like the spleen and like the lymph nodes and like the bone marrow and like the liver. And this will induce hypertrophy of these tissues. So when it multiply within the macrophages inside the liver, this eventually will result in hepatomegaly. And when it do the same things within the spleen, this will result in massive splenomegaly. And this massive splenomegaly eventually will precipitate even pancytopenia due to hypersplenism, because when the spleen enlarges in size, it will increase its function. And this will result in hypersplenism. Along with that, also, it, these parasites will multiply within the lymph nodes. And when it multiplies within the lymph nodes, it will result in generalized lymphadenopathy. And also, it will multiply within the bone marrow, and it will replace the normal cellular elements of the bone marrow, and it will result in bone marrow failure. And this will also worsen the pancytopenia seen in these patients. So as you can see, the complications and features of visceral leishmaniasis are due to multiplication of the parasite within the reticuloendothelial system. The reticuloendothelial system is also called the mononuclear phagocyte system because these are the network of phagocytic cells, cells which are characterized by phagocytosis, which can exert phagocytosis, like macrophages, like histiocytes, and like dendritic cells. And these cells are mainly scattered in the liver, and in the spleen, in the lymph nodes, and in the bone marrow. <clears throat> so that's why these are the areas in which the parasite will multiply in visceral leishmaniasis. And these parasites are intracellular parasites, so it will be found inside the macrophages in these organs. Then after that, the amastigoids, which will be formed in the body, which will be taken and it will be ingested by another sand fly when feeding on infected patients or animal reservoir. And this is how eventually the infection will be transmitted between people, between, between people in endemic regions. Look at this is all about the life cycle of Lishmani. So as you can see here, simply, the vector is a sand fly. The sand fly will bite the human and it will inter introduce the form called promastigot. These are the promastigots which are introduced into the human body. Then these promastigots will be taken by the macrophages, as you can see here. And inside the macrophages, the promastigots will transform into another form called a mastigot. And this amastigot form is the pathogenic form of the parasite. And eventually, this amastigot will multiply in large number, and it will induce lysis of the macrophages, and it will be released from the macrophages. And eventually, it will produce the disease. In case of cutaneous, it will invade the dermis only. In case of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, it will invade the dermis and mucosa. In case of visceral leishmaniasis, it will invade the dermis as well as the visceral organs, especially the organs of the reticuloendothelial system. So then let's talk about the clinical features and complications of the different forms of leishmaniasis. As we said, we have three main forms. First, we will talk about visceral leishmaniasis. And this is actually the most important uh, form of the disease because this is the most aggressive form of the disease. The other types are less aggressive. But visceral leishmaniasis is, not, is less common compared to cutaneous leishmaniasis. Anyway, the features of visceral leishmaniasis, first, we have non-specific features. And these include high-grade fever, which usually accompanied by rigors, and chills, and also it's associated with weight loss. Here there is an important point. The weight loss in visceral leishmaniasis, sometimes it can be associated with poor appetite. But in other patients, there is weight loss despite good appetite. So not always in visceral leishmaniasis there is loss of appetite. Some patients are actually having good appetite with visceral leishmaniasis, but always there is weight loss 
And what you need to know about visceral leishmaniasis is it's a chronic, it can be considered as a chronic tropical disease. So the patient will have a long-standing intermittent fever, and it's usually associated with rigors and chills and weight loss, plus or minus loss of appetite. <clears throat> but these features are non-specific features. That means you can find similar features with other infectious diseases. And it might be difficult to diagnose visceral leishmaniasis based on these non-specific features. Then along with that, <clears throat> the patient also will have features and complications related to the proliferation and multiplication of the parasite within the reticuloendothelial system. Because this is the main site of leishmania, of visceral leishmania parasites multiplication. So when the parasite multiply within the liver and the spleen, eventually this will result in enlargement of these organs. So the patient will have hepatosplenomegaly. Splenomegaly with visceral leishmaniasis, it tend to be massive splenomegaly. And this is an important differential diagnosis. In tropical diseases and in endemic countries, when you find a patient with massive splenomegaly, you will have specific differential diagnosis. One of the possible causes is visceral leishmaniasis. But there are other conditions which can also give you massive splenomegaly, even with fever, like tropical splenomegaly syndrome or hyperreactive splenomegaly syndrome, which we talked about it previously in malaria. And also brucellosis sometimes can give you massive splenomegaly and also chronic myeloid leukemia and lymphoma. So all these are possible conditions which can result in massive splenomegaly. So visceral leishmaniasis is one of the differential diagnoses of fever with massive splenomegaly. And along with that also, the parasite will multiply within the phagocytic cells in the lymph nodes, and it will result in enlargement of the lymph nodes. So it will result in generalized lymph adenopathy. And also, it will infiltrate and it will multiply within the bone marrow and it will replace the normal cellular elements of the bone marrow. And this eventually will result in bone marrow suppression or bone marrow, bone marrow failure. So the patients will suffer from pancytopenia. And this pancytopenia is also worsened by this, the massive splenomegaly. Because with massive splenomegaly, there is hypersplenism which also results in pancytopenia. So the mechanism of pancytopenia in visceral leishmaniasis is related to hypersplenism and related to bone marrow failure. And actually, this pancytopenia is the main problem in these patients. Because in pancytopenia, the patient can develop severe anemia. Pancytopenia means anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia. The anemia sometimes can be so severe up to the extent that it can result in anemic heart failure, which can be a cause of death in these patients. The leukopenia is associated with immunosuppression. So these patients are immunocompromised and they are prone to secondary infections. And they are prone specifically to secondary bacterial pneumonias as well as gastroenteritis. And also, for some reason, these patients with visceral leishmaniasis tend to suffer from amoebic and bacillary dysentery. Because there are a lot of secondary infections which can develop in these patients because these patients are having pancytopenia and part of this, there is leukopenia. And finally, also, there is thrombocytopenia. And with thrombocytopenia, the patient will have bleeding tendency. And actually, one of the common presentation in, in desert leishmaniasis is with epistaxis. And sometimes it can be uncontrolled, epistaxis. And this is due to thrombocytopenia. And also, the patient might have other forms of bleeding disorders. <clears throat> bleeding tendency, bleeding from other orifices. So these are the main problems in visceral leishmaniasis. There is pancytopenia, which results in anemia, results in recurrent secondary infections, and results in bleeding tendency. Along with that also, these patients, some patients might develop hyperpigmentation. And this hyperpigmentation is mainly seen in people who are having yani, light or white skin, color of the skin and it will result in blackish discoloration of the skin. And this is why visceral leishmaniasis is called Kalazar. Kalazar is an Indian term which indicates black. So that the name is given after the hyperpigmentation which can be noticed in some patients with visceral leishmaniasis because it will make the color of the skin black. It will result in black discoloration of the skin. Because this is another possible presentation with visceral leishmaniasis. Then also, some patients in advanced cases of visceral leishmaniasis, they might present with lower limbs edema or even generalized body edema. And this edema is due to severe hypoalbuminemia. And this hypoalbuminemia is mainly nutritional hypoalbuminemia. It's quite possible in patients with advanced cases of visceral leishmaniasis to detect hypoalbuminemia, which will result in edema. <clears throat> 
Then there is a condition called post calazar dermal leishmaniasis. This is a type of cutaneous manifestations seen following the treatment of visceral leishmaniasis. Some patients in endemic regions, like in our country or like in India, it was found that these patients, after treatment of visceral leishmaniasis, these patients would present months or years later with characteristic skin lesions. These skin lesions or cutaneous manifestations are called post calazar dermal leishmaniasis. And they develop months or years after the treatment of visceral leishmaniasis. These lesions are described, these lesions are mainly found detected over the face and especially over around the chin area of the face. And it is, it's mainly appears as a nodular rash, but sometimes it can also appear like a macular rash and also like papular and even like plaques. It, it, can, it can be of different forms. There are different types of skin lesions which can be found in post-Calazar dermal leishmaniasis. But the lesions mainly characteristically tend to appear over the face. As you can see here in this picture, this is a patient from India suffering from post-Calazar dermal leishmaniasis. The lesions here are different. Mainly there are nodules, but also there is macules, there, is, there are plaques, and there are papules at the same time. So there are multiple skin lesions in these patients. And this is called post-Calazar dermal leishmaniasis, and it develops many months or years after the treatment of visceral leishmaniasis. So these are the main features of visceral leishmaniasis. So the main complications of this disease is related to the bone marrow suppression and related to hyperspinism, which will result in pancytopenia. Then when we talk about the cutaneous form of leishmaniasis, in cutaneous leishmaniasis, the characteristic skin lesion is crusted lesion with underlying ulcer. And these skin lesions developed at the site of the sand fly bite. What happens here in these patients, following the sand following the sand fly bite, there is an incubation period of two to three months usually. Then after that, the patient at the side of the bite will start to develop small papules. It can be a single papule or multiple small papules. And these papules eventually will enlarge in size. And after that, it will become ulcerated. It will form an ulcer. And on top of that ulcer, a crust will be formed. And this eventually will result in the formation of crusted lesion with the underlying ulcer. And this is the characteristic lesion in cutaneous leishmaniasis. When you scrap off the crust over the lesion, you will detect an underlying ulcer. And these lesions will be detected at the site of the sand fly bite. So as you can see here in this picture, in this picture, the patient is having crusted lesion over the face. This is a crust here, and there is an underlying ulcer as well. So these are characteristic cutaneous leishmaniasis lesions. Sometimes it can be a single lesion at single area, but sometimes it can be multiple lesions. Here on the right, this is a clear ulcer of cutaneous leishmaniasis. So here there is a crust, crusted lesion, and here there is an ulcer. And these are the typical lesions of cutaneous leishmaniasis. And as I said, this is the most common form of leishmaniasis worldwide. Then we have mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, which is the least common form. Here, the skin lesions may spread to involve the mucosa of the upper airways, resulting in tissue destruction. So here, the disease is not, it's not only involving the skin, but it's also involving the mucous membranes. It will involve the skin to result in lesions similar to cutaneous leishmaniasis, but also it will invade the mucous membranes, like the mucous membrane of the upper airways in the nose, in the mouth, and in the throat. And it will result in ulceration of the mucous membranes, and also it will result in destruction of the of, of of these tissues. For example, it might destroy the internasal septum, resulting in nasal deformity. It will also result in destruction of the upper airways, and this will predispose the patient to recurrent respiratory tract infections. So this is the main problem with mucocutaneous leishmaniasis: the fact that it results in destruction of the mucus of, of the upper airways because it involves the mucosa of the upper airways. <clears throat> so these are the main clinical features and complications associated with different forms of leishmaniasis. Then let's talk about how to diagnose this disease. The diagnosis of the gold standard 
diagnostic tests of leishmaniasis, whatever the form of the disease, is by microscopic demonstration of the parasite on tissue samples. You need to obtain tissue samples where you will expect the parasite is multiplying, and you need to demonstrate the parasite in these tissue samples. And so it will depend on the form of the disease. For example, if it's visceral leishmaniasis, then you need to obtain tissue samples from the reticuloendothelial tissues, like the liver, like the spleen, and like the bone marrow, and like the lymph nodes. So you can do splenic aspirate, you can do bone marrow aspiration, you can do lymph node biopsy, and you can do liver biopsy. And in these tissue samples, you can demonstrate the Leishmania Donovani bodies, which are the parasites associated with visceral leishmaniasis. The most sensitive tissue which can demonstrate the parasite in case of visceral leishmaniasis is splenic aspirate from the spleen. But the problem with the splenic aspirate is the fact that it can result in uncontrolled bleeding. Because remember, the spleen is massively enlarged and the patient is having thrombocytopenia. So when you do splenic aspirate, there is a chance that you will induce severe bleeding. And so this is an aggressive way to diagnose uh, visceral leishmaniasis. And, and for that reason, we will depend on less invasive types of biopsy. For example, we can do lymph node biopsy or we can do bone marrow aspiration, which are less invasive than splenic aspirate, although splenic aspirate is more specific and sensitive than lymph node and bone marrow aspirate. <clears throat> In case of cutaneous and mucocutaneous, we can diagnose, we can identify and demonstrate the parasites on microscopic examination on skin biopsy. <clears throat> So this is the gold standard diagnostic test for leishmaniasis in general. But along with that, also we have other serological tests which can confirm the diagnosis. These serological tests are based on detecting the antibodies formed against the parasite. When the patient develops any form of leishmaniasis, the immune system will react against the parasite and it will produce different types of antibodies. And we can detect these antibodies by serological tests. There are different serological tests available to detect leishmania parasite. For example, we have ELISA, we have immunofluorescence antibody tests, we have direct agglutination tests, and we have another test called recombinant K39 tests. In the developed countries, like UK, they usually use ELISA and immunofluorescence antibody tests as part of the serological diagnosis of leishmaniasis. But in developing countries and in poor countries, which are highly endemic, like our own country, we will depend on other tests like direct agglutination tests and like recombinant K39 tests. And actually in our local protocol for the diagnosis of leishmaniasis, it's recommended to do one of these tests, direct agglutination test or RK39 tests. The other tests are not done here in, in our country. <clears throat> So these are different serological tests. The RK39 test is based on using a recombinant Leishmaniel antigen. This is a recombinant antigen called K39 antigen. And this antigen will be used in the test. It will be added to the serum of the patient. And we will detect if there is an immune reaction, if there are antibodies reacting against this antigen. If the test is positive, that means the patient is having antibodies against Leishmania parasite. And that means the patient is having Leishmaniasis. <clears throat> So, and this test also has the advantage of giving the results within 30 minutes. It can give you the results within within very short time, within 30 minutes. And for that reason, this test is highly used in endemic areas with leishmaniasis. <clears throat> but the problem with these serological tests, and the reason why these are not gold standard tests like microscopic examination of tissue samples, is the fact that these tests, number one, cannot be used to monitor the response to treatment. Because once you start a treatment, even if the, if, the, if the infection is eradicated completely, these tests will remain positive for a while. So you cannot use these tests to monitor the response to treatment. Along with that also, another disadvantage related to these tests, in the endemic regions, there are some individuals infected with leishmania parasite, but they are not showing a clinical disease. They are not developing vesicular leishmaniasis. But, they, but in these patients, when you do serological tests, it will come positive. But this means that the patient is carrying the parasite, but the patient is not actually having the clinical disease. And in these endemic areas, remember, there are other possible tropical diseases, like malaria, for example. So these patients sometimes might present with a febrile illness, and this febrile illness could be due to malaria. But when you do one of the serological tests for leishmaniasis, it will come positive. But these positive results 
not necessarily to indicate that the febrile illness is due to leishmaniasis in the endemic country. It could be due to malaria or other tropical disease because there are a lot of other tropical diseases in these countries other than leishmaniasis. And, this, and some patients are just infected, they are carrying the parasite, but they are asymptomatic. They are not having clinical disease caused by leishmania parasite. So this, is an, this is another disadvantage يعني, for, for these tests. And for that reason, the most specific and accurate test is microscopic examination of tissue samples to demonstrate the parasites in different tissues where the parasite is multiplying. <clears throat> Along with that also, we can do other non-specific investigations. We can do complete blood count. We can check the CBC. In the CBC, as we said, the main problem is pancytopenia. So if you have a patient in endemic region with, with long-standing fever and with pancytopenia, you sh this should raise the suspicion of visceral leishmaniasis. <clears throat> but again, sometimes the white cell count can be elevated. If there is a secondary bacteria infection, the white cell count will become high in these patients. Another important point also, there are some HIV patients who are also co-infected with visceral leishmaniasis specifically. So it's important also when you have a patient with visceral leishmaniasis, it will also screen for HIV as part of your workup. Because it's quite possible to have a co-infection of HIV with visceral leishmaniasis. As you can see here, this is microscopic examination of biopsy specimen and as you can see the parasite the amastogoids are mainly found intracellularly within the macrophages as you can see there are few extracellular amastigotes but mainly are detected intracellularly without within the macrophages <clears throat> finally let's talk about the management of leishmaniasis in general we have two main group of drugs used. We have two main drugs used in the management of leishmaniasis worldwide. The first drugs are called antimonials. These antimonials include a classical drug called sodium stibogluconate. When we talk about antimonials, the classical drug here is sodium stibogluconate. And this is the mainstay treatment of leishmaniasis in most of the areas in the world. And when this sodium stibogluconate is used, Usually, it will be combined with another drug, which is aminoglycoside antibiotic. And this aminoglycoside antibiotic is called paromomycin. So usually, when sodium stibogluconate is used, it will be combined with paromomycin, which is aminoglycoside antibiotic. Then there is another option, which is liposomal amphotericin B, which is primarily is an antifungal drug, but also it can be used as an anti leishmanian drug. So these are the main options. We have sodium stibogluconate and we have liposomal amphotericin B. The question is, which drug to choose? The choice of the anti leishmanian drug depends, number one, on the region in which the patient is infected. In most of the regions, the first line is sodium stibogluconate. For example, in Africa, especially here in Sudan, the first line in the management of leishmaniasis is sodium stibogluconate. But there are certain regions in the world in which the Leishmania species has shown resistance against sodium stibogluconate. And for that reason, in these areas, we will use liposomal amphotericin B. These areas are the Indian subcontinent countries, like in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. In these countries, in the Indian subcontinent, the Leishmania species are associated with resistance towards the sodium stibogluconate. So in these areas, the first line is liposomal amphotericin B. Along with that, in UK, also there are some reported cases with leishmaniasis. The, the, the most of the cases of leishmaniasis imported to UK actually coming from India, from the Indian subcontinent. And for that reason, when you are treating leishmaniasis in UK, you will give the first line liposomal amphotericin B because since these parasites mainly coming from the Indian subcontinent, that means it will be resistant to antimonial drugs. So in Indian subcontinent and in UK, the first line is liposomal amphotericin B. But in other endemic regions like in Africa, we still use sodium stibogluconate like the as the first line. Okay, this is the first factor which will determine the choice of anti leishmaniasis drug, the region of the infected individual. The second, the other factors which determine the choice are the contraindications to the drugs. 
Sodium stibogluconate is a very toxic drug. It has a lot of side effects and a lot of contraindications. Number one, sodium, the side effects of sodium stibogluconate can include myalgia, arthralgia. It can be cardiotoxic. It results in cardiotoxicity and proarrhythmia. It can precipitate arrhythmias. On ECG, it will result in prolongation of the QT interval. It will result in ST segment elevation on ECG. So it's an arrhythmic drug. Along with that, also, there are some cases of pancreatitis with sodium stibogluconate. And also, it's hepatotoxic. And it has a lot of adverse effects on pregnancy. It, it, it interferes with the implantation. And also, it affects the fertility. Because there are a lot of disadvantages and side effects with sodium stibogluconate. It's a very toxic drug. And for that reason, there are a lot of contraindications. And if there are any contraindications with sodium for, for the use of sodium stibogluconate, then we will consider liposomal amphotericin B, even if the patient is in endemic area without resistance to sodium stibogluconate. What are these contraindications? For example, if the patient is having liver disease, we cannot use sodium stibogluconate because it's hepatotoxic. If the patient is having cardiac disease, you will not use the sodium stibogluconate because it's cardiotoxic. If the patient is pregnant, also you will not use sodium stibogluconate because it's bad in pregnancy. You will use liposomal amphotericin B. Also, if the patient is known case of HIV, in patients with HIV and co-infected with leishmaniasis, it was found that leishmaniasis in HIV patients are resistant also to sodium stibogluconate. And so in HIV patients, the first line is liposomal amphotericin B. Because these are yeah, the main, yeah, uh, the, these are how to, these are the main ways by which you will choose which anti leishmaniasis drug in the management of leishmaniasis. So if the patient is in the region where there is resistance to sodium stibogluconate, the first line will be liposomal amphotericin B. If the patient is having liver disease or cardiac disease, or if it's pregnant lady, or if the patient is having HIV, in all these cases, the first line will be liposomal amphotericin B. But if there are no contraindications to sodium stibogluconate and the patient is in the area which is which is not associated with resistant, resistant to sodium stibogluconate like our country in Sudan here still sodium stibogluconate is working effectively and there is no reported significant resistance. And so still sodium stibogluconate is the first line in these areas unless there are contraindications. Or if the patient is started already on sodium stibogluconate but it failed to control the condition. In case of treatment failure with sodium stibogluconate, then you will switch to liposomal amphotericin B. Or in case of the patient develop side effects during treatment. If the patient developed severe side effects like pancreatitis or hepatotoxicity, then you will stop sodium stibogluconate and you will replace it with liposomal amphotericin B. Because this is how to choose anti leishmanian drug. But in general, these are the two main anti leishmanian drugs used in the management of leishmaniasis, of different forms of leishmaniasis. Liposomal amphotericin B, we talked about it previously in pharmacology lecture. The main side effects related to this drug is nephrotoxicity. It can result in acute tubular necrosis. But the risk of nephrotoxicity is less in liposomal forms of the drug. Because there are other non-liposomal forms of the drug which are associated with higher risk of nephrotoxicity. So if you are using amphotericin B for any reason, it's better to use the liposomal form of the drug because it's less nephrotoxic. <clears throat> and this is the main side effect of uh, liposomal amphotericin B. Along with that, there are other also drugs which can be used as an anti leishmanian drugs like pentamidine, for example. But these are the two main drugs used in the management of different forms of leishmaniasis. Also, it's important to know that these drugs can be given parenterally and also it can be given sometimes intralesionally, especially the sodium stibogluconate. In case of visceral leishmaniasis, you will always give this drug parenterally. But if the patient is having cutaneous leishmaniasis, sometimes you can give intralesional sodium stibogluconate in combination with topical paromomycin. If the lesion is limited and small and confined to a single area, in that case, you can give intralesional sodium stibogluconate in combination with topical paromomycin. But if you have a patient with cutaneous leishmaniasis with multiple lesions and extensive disease, then you will give parenteral. You will not give topical or intralesional. You will give parenteral sodium stibogluconate.
And if the patient is having mucocutaneous, in mucocutaneous also you have to give parenteral because the disease now is involving the mucous membrane, not just limited to the skin. So you cannot just you cannot just give interlesional drugs. You have to give parenteral. <clears throat> so this this are the main and these are the specific drugs and anti, anti leishmanial drugs in the management of different forms of leishmaniasis. Along with that, also it's important in leishmaniasis not just to consider the specific anti leishmanial drugs, but also you should treat the complications. Some patients might present with bleeding manifestations. Some patients might present with secondary infections. Some patients might present with severe anemia. You so should. You should also consider supportive treatment and management of the complication. For example, you can consider blood transfusion. You can consider platelet transfusion. You can consider antibiotics for secondary infection. And also you should pay attention to the nutritional and hydration state of the patient. You should keep the patient well hydrated with good nutrition. Because these patients, they tend to develop weight loss and sometimes they can become dehydrated. 